Hey guys, Prowl1701 here, and today we are going to be reviewing the fifth Doctor story, Frontios. Now, I'll talk about episode four first, and then the story as a whole, as I haven't reviewed episode four separately. Uh, episode four, I feel like it doesn't quite live up to the rest of the story. It's good. Um, I don't like that the second-in-command guy kind of dies needlessly. I saw it coming. You know, they get the captain's son out, and then Turlo seems mesmerized by the machine, even though he's the one who should be terrified of it. And then they fight to have him back, but while holding Turlo back, the second-in-command guy gets caught up in it, and he orders him to leave. You leave now. That's an order. And then we never see him again. We just see that thing coming down. Felt kind of like a needless classic Who character death. Unnecessary, especially since I liked the character. He'd really kind of grown on me over the course of the series. He wasn't quite as two-dimensional as I thought he was going to be early on. Davison is great in this. I really enjoy Davison in this, especially at the end when they're like, ha, ah, we could, we would all be dead if it wasn't for you. And he's just like, don't mention it <laughs> at all. <laughs> and how Tegan's like, like, seriously, don't tell anybody. That would be bad. I really like in this story how the fifth doctor is not supposed to be there, that he's not supposed to interfere. This is one of those areas where the time Lords are like, you know, they're in their non-interference phase. Uh, like he tells them, um, and then he's having to kind of tiptoe around the Time Lords here and hope they don't find out about what he did. I like, because I love when the Doctor is scared of the Time Lords. I like in Classic Who, you know, this has kind of that War Games vibe where he does not want to get involved with the Time Lords. He doesn't want anything to do with that because it's a massive headache and he doesn't want to deal with it. So I enjoy that going in this story. Uh, the, the whole thing with the Tractators... It's weird the way this resolves. Like, if we isolate the one tractator from the other tractators, everything will be okay, and then the one will just kind of pass out, and then the others will go back to being... It's really weird to me how that works. I thought it was cool when they found the TARDIS in different pieces. I liked the way that set design looked, and how he had to trick the guy, the lead tractator, into it, and then reform it. To, it's really weird. That didn't really work for me. The resolution of the story doesn't quite work for me. I still like it, but it didn't really work. Um, I didn't like the bit where the creature realizes he's a Time Lord, and they think that the Time Lord sent him there. But then they kind of, he kind of gets buddy-buddy with them. I mean, he's only pretending, of course. But the fact the Tractators trust him, I guess they were worried he was going to report them back to the Time Lords. It's just weird that they're buddy-buddy with him, and of course when he turns out he's not helping them, they're, you will die, Dr. Da-da-da. It's always really odd to me when that happens. Um, I thought their idea was cool of trying to hollow out that cavern so they could use the planet, you know, as basically a ship and move it to other planets. That's a neat concept. I like that. You know, basically put rockets on it, you know, kind of like the pirate planet, vampire planet, and move it to, you know, inhabit and infest other planets. That's neat. Um, I just, I feel like the payoff's not there. I, again, I like the ending when they're all, oh, thank you, Doctor, we couldn't survive without you. And he's like, hey, don't say that too loud. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I like that he leaves them the hat rack. That's, that's funny. The story as a whole, I did really enjoy. I was really impressed with the set design, especially considering it was all studio bound. And having watched the behind the scenes stuff, I know it was a set designer that was new to Doctor Who. Um... And having to replace a character, I mean, a, an actor at the last moment, because the character who was originally supposed to play the scientist was, like, actually murdered. Like, literally murdered in his flat uh, not long before they started rehearsal. That's insane. They actually did, in the behind the scenes, they talk about that. Uh, he was uh, gay. You know, keep in mind, this is 1983. I think he was gay. And I don't know if they, they don't say whether that was part of the motivations, but like they, they, he got murdered in his flat. That's insane. It's an insane thing that they spent more time than I would have thought they would talking about on the behind the scenes stuff. That was, that's crazy. Uh, and they had to bring in someone last minute to play the, uh, the lead scientist, the, the girl's father scientist. Uh, that, that's crazy stuff. I always recommend people to watch the behind the scene documentaries that they do on the DVDs and on the collection sets because you learn a lot of fascinating things uh, that can make you appreciate the story more. Time and the Ronnie does this for me. Knowing everything that went on behind the scenes with Time and the Ronnie makes me give Time and the Ronnie a little more leniency because it's amazing it came off as good as it is. 
And Frontios, again, had a couple things. Uh, the original production designer who was supposed to be making the sets had like a meltdown. And I think he later took his own life as well. Uh, so they had to bring in this other guy to do the sets. And you know, it, it's crazy. And the sets look really good. I actually really enjoy the sets, especially in the first couple episodes when it has that red tint to them. And I talked about how in my review for part one, that one shot when they're all running around on the ground and you can see the ship behind them is really well done. The effect they, they do when they're running around during the meteor shower and the ship's behind, that's impressive. It's really impressive. I like the shot in, a, in part two when you first see the tractators, but you don't know it's them, they're kind of turned around like this. So they just look like little cocoon rocks sitting there and Turlo and the scientist's daughter just walk past them. And then after that, you see them turn and then start following them. That's the first time you see them. That was a cool moment. I didn't see it coming. And I was, I remember in my review of part two, I mentioned how impressed I was with that. Um, I thought the sets looked good. Uh, the, when they actually are going from the ship down into the cave, that looks really good. I know one of the, the set designer in an interview talked about how that was his favorite because you really got to work with levels there and see people up top and see people on bottom. That looked really good. The, the caves were, was a really good set. Outside on the planet's surface looked really good. The interior of the ships looked pretty good. I was really impressed with the set design. I liked a lot of the actors. <clears throat> the guy playing the captain's son does a good job of this person who has been thrust into this position he's clearly not ready for yet, who's overcompensating uh, and who's trying to blame the doctor for everything, but it slowly realizes the doctor's there to help. Uh, the guy Again, the guy playing the second in command, I really liked him. The actor playing him did a really good job for me. Um, I, he definitely turned out to be a little more fleshed out of a character than I anticipated. The girl playing the scientist's daughter was fine. I mean, everybody to me did it pretty well. Turlo, we really got to see some of Turlo's backstory a little here, finding out that his people had fought uh, this race before and just how dangerous they were and planted in his ancestral memory that it, it, it literally, like, freaked him out and drove him, you know, into, like, a, a fugue state temporarily. That was pretty impressive to see. Uh, and then just Davison in this one. I really like Davison. That line in the first one, when the captain in part one, when the captain's when he's chewing into the the captain's son, and he's like, and I think, and remember, you did ask me what I think that you know your colony is on the verge of extinction. The way he delivers that line, oh, I love it. And you did ask me what I think. I love that. Really good. Davison has some really good moments here. Seems like in season 21, he really was finding his footing with the character, I think, from what I've seen of season 21. He, he really was kind of uh, taking the character in directions, you know, whereas in early in his run, he was kind of indecisive what he wanted to do with the character. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why he's so popular in Big Finish is, you know, he, he understands more now what he wants to do with the character. And uh, that's very apparent in this episode. Uh, again, I think the first two parts are better than the third and fourth parts. And some of part four does have me. But I still think it's a really good story. I definitely enjoyed it. It's one I always wanted to see. And it was actually one um, one of my subscribers sent to me. Uh, Robin sent that one. Robin has actually sent me a few things, which I really appreciate, Robin. Thank you. It's been really nice to um, get all of the stories I've been getting in. But it's interesting, too, to uh, get something that kind of gives me a break from the First Doctor. Because I have a lot of First Doctor stuff I have to watch. Um... I'm probably going to watch one of the Cushing films next and then move on to Keys of Marinus. I did get my copy of Time Meddler in recently. I'm looking forward to watching that. And then uh, I need to watch Dalek Invasion of Earth 2150. And then I need to do a comparison video between it and the series Dalek Invasion of Earth. Uh, so a lot of good stuff coming. Several books I need to get through. Uh, my copy of Highlanders I think should be coming in soon. Really looking forward to that because um, I really, really want to read that. I love Troughton. But yeah, Frontios, it's good. I liked it. It was really good. I just, I wish the, the final kind of lived up to the first half of the story, but it's still really, really good. I enjoyed it. So I would like to know what you think of Frontios, if you've seen it. So comment down below. How long has it been since the last time you watched it? Maybe you need a refresher on it. Other things to do while I have you here. Uh, if I haven't earned that subscription, yet, I'd like to earn that today. If you've been watching the channel for a while and haven't quite clicked that subscribe button yet, I'd really appreciate it if you went ahead and did that and clicked the like button as well. 
Uh, my goal is to grow the channel to a thousand subscribers, so we're slowly but surely getting there. If you want to help me out with that, I also have a PO box. If there's anything you would like to send me, Doctor Who related, sci-fi related, or otherwise that you want me to unbox and review, uh, my PO box is down in the description below. I have a link to my Amazon wish list as well, which I have added several things to recently, including. Um, Quatermass in the Pit, something I've always wanted to see because I keep hearing it's a huge influence on 60s and 70s Doctor Who, apparently, because I hear it, I hear people talk about it in like behind the scenes stuff all the time. So if it's that important to Doctor Who, I want to see it. And, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Is it a movie, several movies, a series, a series and movie? It's really confusing. Apparently there's a 58 movie and a 67 movie, and I think the 67 movie might be the U.S. remake of the 58 movie. It's really confusing. But I have, I think, the 2018 Blu-ray release of the 58 movie on my Amazon wish list. It's something I definitely want to see. Uh, and I have a few other things non-Doctor Who related on there, like a Battlestar Galactica set I wouldn't mind getting. Um, but if you would prefer to support me another way, I do have a Patreon with different rewards and tiers for that. Uh, I am trying to get in the habit of doing an exclusive video at least once a week for all of my patrons. Uh, early access to some videos, polls to vote in for stuff that will happen on the channel and exclusive videos they may get, stuff like that. Little behind the scenes things like life updates, uh, late night with Prowlies as one of as, with Prowly as one of my uh, Patreons calls it. I think that might be what I call it from now on. I love that name, late night with Prowly. I like that. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, I would appreciate you taking a minute to check that out as well. Most importantly, though, thank you for watching.